to welcome Reverend John to share with you what, what he calls his Sunday enrichment, encouragement, enlivenment, upliftment. Because there's always a, a, a jewel of a message in, in what he says, and it always speaks to you from where you have the greatest desire in your own heart. So please welcome with me our, our speaker, our minister, our pastor this morning, Reverend John Scott. Thank you, Sandy, and morning, family. And we also say morning to all of our members who are out doing the Sigma run. God bless them, because that's also part of our ministry, to take this teaching in our lives beyond the borders of our church. Welcome to, to those who watch us on the World Wide Web and join us in consciousness all over the globe. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Um, you know, when Sandy entered the prayer room this morning, she was, I think, preoccupied with something in her hand and then maybe in her bag, and then she looked up and saw me and she gasped. And so I said, what to myself, this old thing? Um, and she said, you know, you're such a striking man, which I'm so glad. She's looking through striking eyes. But, but there's a story behind this tunic which I want to share with you. Um, it's about 40 years old, well, 37, 1981, that makes what, 37? I had a, 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 a friend uh, back in, actually they're still my friends, but in 1981 she had an African boyfriend um, who was courting her hot, hot, hot. And on a, a visit to the Côte d'Ivoire, um, he, he bought this tunic and sent it for her father. So of course, you know, he's a macho Jamaican man, and when it came and was unfolded, I was at their house, and he said, it's a frock. <laughs> so I had just started coming to this church, and I said, no, it's a tunic. He said, you can call it anything. I'll tell you what, Stephan, you give it to John. He's the only man I know in Jamaica with enough cojones to wear a frock. <laughs> so I inherited it. And that was 37 years. So every year at Black History Month or at some time when I want to make the point about um, our, our, our heritage, I trot it out and um, dust it off and sun it and put it on. So speaking of old things and of ancient history, I want you to think back to 730 BCE before the Common Era. Um, there was a man named Pie, and it's spelled P-I-Y-E, and God bless the internet because I could go on and, and, lo and look up the pronunciation. And you know with the internet now, information is available um, in every form. So it not only gave you the pronunciation for English speakers, but for Chinese, Indian, um, you know, for every other nationality, German, how did you pronounce P-I-Y-E? -P it's Pie. And Pie decided that the only way to save Egypt in 730 BCE, uh, to save Egypt from itself, was to invade it. And this he successfully did, thus becoming the first of a series of Nubian kings who ruled over all of Egypt as the country's 25th dynasty. <laughs> Through inscriptions on stelae by both Nubians and their enemies, it is possible to map out these rule, those rulers' vast footprint on the continent. The black pharaohs reunified a tattered Egypt, which had been torn apart by petty warlords and filled its landscape with glorious monuments, creating an empire that stretched from the southern border of present-day Khartoum all the way north to the Mediterranean Sea. They stood up to the bloodthirsty Assyrians and perhaps even saved Jerusalem in the process. I gleaned this interesting historical information from a February 2008 issue of National Geographic magazine, which featured a story titled, The Black Pharaohs, Conquerors of Ancient Egypt. According to National Geographic, the ancient world was devoid of racism. Let me quote from the article, quote, at the time of Pierre's historic conquest, the fact that his skin was dark was irrelevant. Artwork from ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome shows a clear awareness of racial features and skin tone, but there is little evidence that darker skin was seen as a sign of inferiority. Only after the European powers colonized Africa in the 19th century did Western scholars pay attention to the color of Nubian skin. 
to uncharitable effect, unquote. It is remarkable that theirs was a chapter, my friends, of history that largely went untold, and that as the National Geographic magazine puts it, quote, only in the past four decades have archeologists resurrected their story and come to recognize that the black pharaohs didn't appear out of nowhere. They sprang from a robust African civilization that had flourished on the southern banks of the Nile for 2,500 years, going back at least as far as the first Egyptian dynasty. The National Geographic article brought back a powerful lesson I learned from my own father about the importance of teaching our children their history and their heritage. You know, um, I attended a, what was then called an elementary school. I think it got changed to be called primary school eventually. It was Providence Elementary School at Matilda's Corner. And most of my schoolmates there were, of course, children from lower uh, economic um, families, you know, lower economic backgrounds. But I was then scheduled to, to go to Jamaica College, which was then, and uh, I think still is, one of the premier seat, um, seats of learning. And the night before I was to go to JC, my first day at JC, my father called me um, and, and said, look in the mirror and tell me what you see. So I was busy doing something, a jigsaw or puzzle or whatever I was, I was busy doing. I didn't want to be interrupted, but um, he said, look in the mirror and tell me what you see. So I said very saucily, well, I see me, Dad. And he said, and what is that me that you see? And I thought, oh, Lord, this is going to be one of those long philosophical um, discourses sprinkled liberally with poetry, which he inflicted on my brother Dennis and myself with alarming regularity. And so trying to deflect him, I said, all right, Dad, you tell me. And as if he was reading my mind, he said, no, Jay, it's not going to be a long philosophical lecture. <laughs> but you're going to um, big school tomorrow to JC, and you're going to meet um, boys of many different races and nationalities and income levels, many of whom come from very wealthy families and wealthy homes. And um, he said, but I want you to remember who you are. I thought, oh dear, here we go. So he said, I want you to know that you have a rich heritage, that your ancestors built the pyramids and created the first universities. So I thought, oh God, I have real, weird parents. I must remember never to invite anybody home because they're going to think that we're a weird family. But you know, friends, it wasn't even a week at my new prestigious school when I began to hear boys boasting about whose father was the chairman of which corporation and you know, who drove what Daimler and what um, prestigious car and lived in what prestigious neighborhood. And I even had a boy in my class who had a ring with a coat of arms. I thought only royal families and countries had coats of arms. Um, so, but I still had this sense of knowing whom I was. I had this sense of, you know, me is me. And I, 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 I knew, I felt confident in myself. I didn't link it to my father's very brief lecture. But I had this sense of self. And I remember um, a, a, a young man from a prominent Jewish family saying that, and he, it was truthful, that the synagogue in Kingston was um, the largest in the hemisphere, and that his uh, forefathers had helped to build, uh, to build the synagogue. And I said, that's nothing. My forefathers helped to build the pyramids and made the first university um, known to humankind. And a boy around the back of the class said, boy, I'm weird. <laughs> I said, runs in the family. <laughs> but it was just amazing that that, that whole idea of, of how I was made to think about myself influenced my entire life. And fast forward to 1981 when I came to this, um, to this teaching and to hear that phrase, change your thinking, change your life which is also the title of the program that Reverend Michael and myself and Reverend Ann and Carol Charlton are doing in the, in the prison system here. And then I opened the Santa Mile magazine this morning, and what is the, the title of today's talk? About thinking. And it actually says, the, 
the core of our belief is change your thinking, change your life. And so I thought I would just ask you this morning, as the Science of Mind magazine uh, article asks you, having been working on changing your thinking, what are you doing about it? Because this is, I think it's okay to change your thinking, and Reverend Mack and I are observing this in our, in our ministry at the prison. You can see the lights going off in people's heads. You can see the excitement. Uh, Sandra mentioned it. When you, you, you grab onto it and you think, aha, I've got it. You can see the lights going off in people's eyes and you can, you can hear the transformation in the way they speak and the way they, they address themselves to the, the issues of their lives. Um, we didn't have, excuse me, have a class last Tuesday, but this Tuesday coming, the class will be about blame, shame, and regret keeping us in prison. And I want to suggest to you that a lot of people out, outside the four walls of, of the Correctional Center are imprisoned by the blame, shame, and regret in which we live. And, and which drives us and informs the way we relate to each other, the way we relate to life, the way we relate, we relate to people. Uh, does that make sense? Two people said yes. OK. Uh, but that whole idea of changing your thing, and it's not easy, because you have deeply ingrained sometimes in you those words that were said to you. I remember my father's, but there are a lot of us that have had things said to us as we were in our formative years, which really have stayed with us and have colored how we feel about ourselves. You know, and it can be positive or it can be negative. You know, every time I heard a, a, um, somebody saying to their picnic, you're ugly just like your papa. And it wasn't said with any acrimony or, or malice. It was almost like a tease. And I thought, but you don't know how that child takes that. You meant it as a joke and to, to, you know, to motivate them or to, to spur them to, to, to be better. Uh, you know, go and wash your face, you're ugly like your papa. Um, but that, that can stay and, and create a, a deep, deep groove in that person's consciousness which haunts them all their lives. I don't know if you're like me, but a lot of times it's like you almost have somebody on your shoulder. There's a little voice whispering in your ear, no, you're not good enough. No, that's OK for everybody else, but you, you don't dare do it. Uh, and there's another voice on the other shoulder, hopefully, that says, of course you can. You know, just change the way you think and change the way you approach life, and you can, you can triumph. But the more insistent voice, it used to be the voice of my grandmother. I mean, it actually was her, her voice that said, come here, you're so clumsy. Let me, uh, she'd give me a needle to thread, and I would be fumbling with it, and she'd say, give it here to me, you're so clumsy. And I, all my life, I grew up thinking I was clumsy. Then I went to dancing and found that I was really very graceful, or was made to do graceful things. But I still felt awkward and clumsy. Um, so it's not easy to change those deeply ingrained ideas about who we are and what makes us tick. So we have to work at it. And I love this thing in this answer, man, reading this morning that says, practice. You know, practice, practice, practice. The joke is given about the person who st stood outside Carnegie Hall. You know, you ever been somewhere foreign and you say to people, where is Seventh Avenue? And I said, right here, you're on it. The sign is right over your head. Well, this person was outside Carnegie Hall and said, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? And an arriving um, supercilious young artist said, practice, practice, practice. That's how you get there. So um, that's how we get to the place where we change our, mind, our thinking, and in changing our thinking, change the paradigm we have about our, our, our lives and our circumstances, who we are, and where we believe we're going. Um, the Nubian builders of the Great Pyramids, my friend, were using the laws of geometry and mathematics, which we still haven't been able to fully figure out. And yet we persist in mistakenly limiting the laws of the universe to our present partial understanding of the world. And when we can't interpret it, we say, well, it's not scientific. You know, we dismiss anything that we can't explain. And I can imagine when the, the followers of the beautiful Jesus were, were watching him do the amazing so-called miraculous acts, which again, I believe, were firmly rooted in 
natural laws, but laws that we, we, we don't yet understand, that they were not supernatural, but superbly natural laws, that they were saying, wow, you know. And he said, you can do it too. All you need to do is to believe and to practice what I am teaching you. Now, people say, but we don't worship him. And that's true. We don't worship Jesus. There is nowhere in the scriptures that he said, worship me. What did he say? Follow me. Do what I do. Live by the laws that I am outlining for you. And the kingdom of heaven, which is at hand, will reveal itself to you in your life, in your heart, in your affairs. Follow me. And the way to do that is to change the way we think. And so one of the things that I learned very early was to stop dismissing everything and anything that didn't quite fit with my concept of what life was about and what life should be like. And so I had a little shelf in the back of my mind that I'd say, I don't really understand that, or I don't really agree with that, or I'm not certain I, 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 I subscribe to that. Let me put it on the, on the back shelf until um, I can explore more, learn more, um, and come to it again. Does that ever happen to you? And then something you heard 20 years ago that you said, no. And then you find it again 20 years later, and you say, yeah, that makes sense. You know, I, I came across that a long time ago, and it didn't resonate with me. But yes, it's really true. So I'll never forget uh, our beautiful Sharon Thomas, her blessed memory. Um, and I spoke in a class about surrender. And she said, surrender who? Me? Never. That's the whole thing. Women have been, been made to think that we must surrender. And she gave me a long exposition on why a woman mustn't surrender. And then a year later, she said, oh, guess what? I've come to tell you. I have surrendered. I said, what's his name? <laughs> She said, no, 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 not that the thing you told us last year in class, that surrender isn't, a, a, isn't a, an act of weakness and, uh, and unworthiness. It is a very powerful act to say, see me here, God, take me and use me and show me how I can make this world a place that really works for everyone. And so I just thought, yeah, when we come to it, so don't dismiss anything. Just put it on a back shelf or on a back burner and say, I'll get to you at another time when, when I, I, I may be more open or I've had more information. A lot of times, you know, we make decisions about stuff and it was the best decision at the time. Yes? Ten years later, you find out if I had known then what I know now, I wouldn't have done it that way or I wouldn't have done that or I wouldn't have said that. But guess what happened? At the time that you did it or said it, or believed it, you were doing the best you knew how. I'm seeing parents in the audience go, thank you for that, John. <laughs> yeah, you know? And so um, sometimes in workshops, and I, 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 I talk about that, people say, what, I have to start over and have a whole new set of picnic just to do it the right way? No. But when you know better and you have changed your thinking, you then begin to change your modus operandi and how you approach life and how you think about yourself. So it is this deep understanding and insight into the principles of higher spiritual laws which Jesus used to perform those miracles. And there's a man called Edward Gibbon. He was an 18th century English historian who wrote the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. And he asserts that for 300 years, the followers of Jesus' teaching healed the sick and did other mighty works by their faith in the higher laws made known to them in their gospels, but that as Christianity became more rich and worldly, the knowledge of these higher laws was lost." Unquote. And as we know, modern science and quantum physics is now proving the soundness of those early teachings, which were, believe it or not, not unique to Christianity. Every faith and every religion and almost every culture taught these, these eternal and um, everlasting truths and laws. So we didn't have a, have a uh, what is, what, what you want, the patent on, on the truth. It, it has existed in all cultures and all religions throughout time. But um, Jesus, I think, focused it as a way of life and as a way of being in the world, which if we would follow, would take us from good to greater good and to bring into our experience all that we deserve as the beloved um, expressions of God.
So let us affirm together, my life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Can we say that? My life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. If you change your thinking to that, then you might change your life to it being a testimony of love, light, and joy. Say with me, I am living proof of divine causation. I am living proof of divine causation. I live in accord with the laws of life. I live in accord with the laws of life. Turn to your neighbor and say, your life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Namaste. Your life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Namaste. Your life is a testimony of love, light, and joy. Namaste. Dr. Holmes, who founded this great teaching a hundred years ago, said, and I quote, a religious science church is a place where only two things happen. People are taught about a divine presence and a universal law of good which re reacts to it. Number one, people are taught about a divine presence and a universal law of good which reacts to it. And two, people are taught how to use it. That's all. We have nothing else to sell. End of quote from Ernest Holmes. And so friends, your job is to so live that we actually touch, heal, bless, prosper, love, and liberate everyone with whom we come into contact. So that in knowing of us, one person becomes two. Then two become three. Then three become a hundred. And so on and so forth until this teaching spreads exponentially to touch the four corners of the earth. That's what we're about. That's our mission. It's, it's very simple. And we do it by changing how we think. And when we change how we think, we change how we live our lives. And we can then remember that the Nubians built the pyramids, but we too are building something enormously influential and enormously important in transforming humankind to Godkind. It is a very humbling mission, but it is a mission which everybody can undertake regardless of of their status in life, regardless of their education, regardless of their economic condition. Everybody can so live that we build a monument to truth, a monument which glorifies God in our daily lives. I am very humbled to be a part of that, and I'm so glad that you are too. Namaste.